Greetings, Slashaholics, and welcome to episode 46 of Out of Print Slashers. I am Sean Campbell. I am joined by the 80 Slasher Librarian, Josh LaRue. How are you doing today? Doing good. Doing good. No hat today. It does look my... like you just got out of fight school. Or you're going to fight Spider-Man. I can't really tell at this point. <laughs> I've got a five head going on right now because I'm growing my hair out and got it slicked back. Just trying, trying a new look. See how it goes. All right, I know it's the the book you've been dreading doing like since we started this thing, Jason X for Death Moon. Uh, I, I, you know the way we're gonna, the way I say we should do this episode. I don't know if you remember from Family Guy where it's the the sandwich where you you start out with something good, you say all the bad stuff, and then you end with something good. So it's not like a complete cloud of negativity i do have some good things to say about this book got a lot of bad stuff to say it's gonna be like one of those cartoon sandwiches from scooby-doo that has like all the toppings and cheese and everything and it's held together by two thin pieces of bread so first piece of bread well with all these jason x books it's kind of the same formula uh, military people in space experimenting on jason and yes that is in this book but of the jason books I kind of like that. It was like, what's high school like in space? Um, what What is uh, kids going to the club in space? Uh, what is a camp like in space? You know, there there is a subplot in here. I mean, it, it's supposed to be the main plot, but these, <laughs> these, these delinquent kids, um, you know, they go joyriding, they go to a club, they get arrested, and these people are making this camp on a moon that's desolate, and they're making a camp that while they go there – it's it's a camp for troubled youth, and the kids are going to party, do drugs, have premarital sex. Well, they're actually being monitored because they're they're going to be you know disciplined. And I'm like, okay, I get that. You know that that's that's a pretty interesting story. That's something we haven't seen before. But then you get to a zombie porn director, a guy that's experimenting and making multiple Jasons, and Jason's mom brought back. Then you have um, a subplot with. Uh, military people using spiders to trap Jason in a giant web in a movie theater and some spaceship. Uh, you just have all these subplots. You have characters that come in, never get resolved. You have characters that show up with no warning or explanation whatsoever. There are characters who literally get killed, and then later on they're completely fine, and you find out they were killed in, as a, in, a, in the zombie porn they're trying to make... The, the, I don't. There's this move. This is an incoherent mess. We're getting into the 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 meat the meat of this sandwich. So and and you got the Nazi woman that's been alive for like 150 years or whatever. Which are cryogenically frozen like Austin Powers. Yeah, and you got uh, this author took all the work uh, from Nancy Kilpatrick's uh, uh, Jason X Three Planet of the Beast. Yeah, I definitely love that one. And I thought Nancy, uh, that, that's probably my favorite in the Jason X book series. Uh, and then at the beginning of this book, Alex S. Johnson, who we did invite to come on the podcast, by the way, several invitations to talk with us about it. I, I told him, even though we might not be the biggest fans of the book, we wanted to give him a chance to talk and not, you know, we didn't want to feel like we were just, you know, dogging his book and stuff. Wanted to actually discuss it with him, but I never heard back from him. Uh, the the invitation still. We want to give him a chance to explain himself before we put him in the guillotine. <laughs> uh, the invitation still there, Alex. If you ever want to come on and talk about the book, we will definitely do another episode about it. Uh, we will please, absolutely not bring the guillotine. Yeah, we will. Please, please don't take any offense uh, to what we might say in this podcast. We're just giving our honest opinions as uh, fans of the series. We're not authors. We we don't have the great accomplishment you do. You actually are part of Friday the 13th history. You wrote a novel that is canon for Jason X. It's there in the history books, and I've got I've got a lot of respect for you there. Uh, am I a huge fan of the book itself? No, and I will talk about why. Uh, also, I sent out a correspondence to Slasher Pepper uh, because he had reviewed the book on his channel, and he had asked me to help him, and... Once he told me what book it was, I kind of told him to F off. Uh, but uh, he sent me a video response to, you know, coming on and talking to us about the book. And I'm going to go ahead and play that now. I haven't watched it yet. 
uh, let's see what his opinion is on Death Moon and uh, talking about it with us. So here we go. Hey, Roll. Josh and Sean. I got your email about um, coming on the show and talking Death Moon with you guys. And, you know, all I want to say about that is go fuck yourselves. You know, I, you know what, I'll fucking take this book and some fucking lubricant and shove it up your asshole. You know what, I won't even use lubricant. I'll just do it raw. It'll hurt extra. It'll hurt just as much as reading this book. It was a fucking chore to sit through. It's fucking awful and doesn't make any fucking sense. Which actually brings me to my book review. I reviewed this book like two years ago. I still haven't forgotten about that, Joshua. I asked you on my show to explain it a bit more, like innocently, and then you say, go fuck yourself. Well, now it's my turn. Go fuck yourself. You know, I'm not coming on your show to review this book. If you don't want to be on my show, I don't want to be on your show. So seriously, go fuck yourself. Fuck this book. Fuck your channel. Fuck you. Fuck you, Sean. Fuck you, Joshua. Fuck the 80 slash librarian. Or fuck you slash librarian presents. Whatever the fuck it is nowadays. Go okay, fuck yourself. Okay, Jesus Christ, slasher, pepper. Okay, I get it. I get it. You owed me that one, and if I were you, I probably would have felt the same way. But uh, I got to say, I didn't appreciate how Alex uh, pretty much destroyed this, the plot line from uh, Planet of the Beast by Nancy Kilpatrick. Uh, he pulled an Alien 3. Yeah, killed the killed survivor. Newt. Which I'm so glad that in book five, Nancy was able to retcon that and bring the character back to life and continue that story because uh, Planet of the Beast and To the Third Power are great books. Have we done a video on To the Third Power? I don't think so. Uh, those are some I wouldn't mind revisiting anyways. Maybe the Nancy Kilpatrick uh, books. You know, do talk about them again together and have her on. But yeah, Alex does use a couple characters from her from her story, kills off the main one pretty much, and then uses the doctor uh, in a part of it, the AI thing. I can't remember its name for the life of me now. Um, Major Tom. That, yeah, Major Tom. Yes, Major Tom. You. I feel like Major Tom was only added. So they could make a joke at the end of this book where it's like, ground control to Major Tom. Can you right. read me? Like, this, like, his whole character was written just for a laugh at the end. Which, and okay, I'm, I'm, you know, that that's something, okay, that's funny. Yeah, that was pretty funny. And one of the main characters from Planet of the Beast is a semi-main character in this one. It's just so random. It, it's like he's running from the government or something. It really confused. This book confused me on so many levels. Well, it was confusing because he's introduced. It, it's it's JJ. JJ yeah. is introduced talking to a robot dog, trying to get dirt on this government because he's gonna become a counselor or something in the camp or tech support, and then he's gonna undermine it from the inside. But it's like somebody sucked out a couple pages from this book because he goes from planning to, like, hiding in a mainframe in the camp, and then he <laughs> helps them fight Jason. I'm just like, did we miss the entire, like, story of this character? Because at one part, he starts having dreams, and this might be our first clip. We talk about a lot of this book is, like, slam poetry. Yes. Where it starts talking about nonsense for pages and pages. I mean, there's one part where he's in the mainframe, and then it goes into this tangent about, uh, hold on, Jack, I'm trying to read a book. Uh, uh, hold on, it's here. Oh, there's poetry for five minutes about a fairy in a bookshop and then a cop sucking on an ice cream cone. And then he wakes up in the mainframe and then starts hacking it. And I'm like, what the fuck was that? What did that have to do with any goddamn thing in this book? Like. And this is separate from the clip I have picked out for later, right? <laughs> this is a different one? Yeah, it's a different one. I mean, we can let's, use it. We cannot use it. You know, I just, just e evidence. Do. Evidence for my case. Let's do it. Let's do it. That's our first clip. Jason X, Death Moon. This right, dream, so waking up. I want to be in the podcast so bad. Jack says, roll it. Meow, meow. Jason's machete arm went up and down, up and down, swift and efficient as a threshing machine. 
The mound of carnage grew and grew, a wet, steaming mass of human compost. When he walked away, some of the mass was still twitching. Long ago, Cat the Destroyer scurried out of the store, scuffed pearl face, single ruby earring, black boot feet, pouting for companions in red satin, gather nights and glown nights. An eldritch book winked between her thin digits. This was a fay, fairy green leather bound volume, Eros and Tammuz. Indeterminate insignia stamped her side in gold foil. The spectrum of a razor's edge, a sharp blossoming wire rose. She saw and she read, she read some more and saw, thought made flesh, words gathering gold sparkle, sheen, fullness, radiance, eminence. Sharp words, words sideways and perplexed, bothersome words, bad words, poison words, pinhead dots of mercury, scarab, arabesque, tinctures, blood gems from Satan's wine glass, and silly words like trismegist. Some books were the devil's own claws. Words sat against her chest, burning coins, dark things, real words. She cradled them in secret, perplexed, changeful things, made him suck hoses. She mothered and fed them like squiggling neon worms, and then, when she ate them, all the kids died. Bad words, curse words, swear words, oaths. She whirled, electric counterclockwise, leaves zigzagged in the gutter, red and brown, then softly whispering, black to plump rot. The lingering caresses of a careless giant. Tammuz is one word for taboo. Her son and brother, he is also her lover. Tammuz burns like frozen nitrogen. She waved at a couple in a pork-colored coo. They moved to Arizona and started the sheep ranch. The cop at the soda fountain eating an ice cream crumpled himself in the racing paper, oblivious as so much human origami. Seven gates was the horse to bet on. That's what the paper said. Or maybe it said the seventh gate. The store was even shaped like a big fairy tale house book. Within many powerful books lay hidden, many grimoires and grammars, harrowing opiate foundlings, shadow books etched from pain. Hellebore, Henbane, Belladonna, Razor Books, Blood Tomes, all fall down. Many volumes, lovely, lovely, ruby, ruby voodoo nails, clacking, sorting, counting, smelling. The perfume of black leather, the sting of salt tears. So many owners, such legacies, such ribbons of cobwebs of ghosts, spun from one another. Raven silk, many wonders of the world travel. What is this one? And yes, the Three Mothers Opera by Vermicelli and Morelli. First edition, hardcover, best offer, diner's club, definitely. Many of these tomes have been inscribed secretly by the great lady herself. Some bear her initials scratched into the binding. Others hold her signature in cryptographic and mirrored forms. All children's of Dolores display her mark in some way. This one we hunt, this one we bind, this one we snatch, this one we find. Ashes, ashes. She stepped closer to the cop, a lie, a black book with gilt pages and a scarlet ribbon, watches the fire fairies dance over a cigarette, watches them sway, shudder, dive, a hand at his throat, cancer, the plague, sudden death swallowed up, raven's wings cast glamorous shadows. She stopped, the game no longer amusing, plopped the cop harmlessly back on the shelf. The lively puppet folded his paper into a neat cylinder. Cat passes. We all do. She prayed and passed, a book pressed against her chest, a slight volume in green and gold. They lived, but she read them, knowing their secrets and lies. How they flourished, some lost their way. How some writhed, shrink-wrapped in digitized plastic, in perfect equanimity, tapping away on an ever-shrinking keyboard with one key, a dollar sign, what they told their wives and their sluts and their dogs. When she returned, she would draw a bath, soft light champagne, or maybe a glass of red wine. The water cooked to perfection, bright bubbles gathered at her breasts, music, George Crumb, Liszt, funeral contagion chords, her black cat, Echolastes, scrabbling away in the kitchen at its breakfast tray. The sun turned upside down in absinthe for Ereshkigal.
you know, and as far as characters, okay, the villain in part three was Bordeaux, right? Bordeaux. We got almost the exact same character as Dr. Castillo. I mean, seriously, like, their personalities are so weird how they're like, hmm, someone hacked the system, <laughs> as they experiment. And I'm like, why, why do we have the same weird, mad scientist that's kind of detached from reality? Like, it just, it, at least the, the mad doctor in the second one was like, I'm oh. going to change the world by altering genes or something. I'm like, okay, okay, you know, it's think, different. I think Bordeaux was the evil scientist lady in part two. That in part three gets called a man, where Nancy had messed that up, and uh, and then Castillo was the villain in part th- in part uh, three and four. If if I remember, I think Bordeaux was actually the one in uh, Jason X two. I thought it was a different person because I remember like she was the one that was trying to clone Jason because there was that virus that was turning people into Jasons. Yeah, that was part two. Yeah, but I thought Bordeaux was in, I don't know, it don't, it don't matter, that's just confusing. It's neither here nor there, because that's another thing that gets kind of changed, too. Like, in part three, that female villain is talked about as a male villain. But yeah, it, it's always an evil scientist. Um, uh, you know, you're right, Bordeaux was part three, because he had his little sidekick guy. Um, e- uh, it was like Igor or something? I, I can't, it wasn't Igor, but it was kind of like an Igor-like character. Yes. They were like Pinky in the Brain. Uh, I, I love talking about that one. It's what are we gonna do tonight? The same thing we do every night: try to clone Jason Voorhees by taking DNA from his nutsack, which really happened in Planet of the Beast. Um, but I digress. Death Moon. Uh, yeah, you heard in that clip <laughs> just a piece, a piece of what it was like to read this book. I almost stopped narrating books on the channel. Uh, <clears throat> three or four uploads into this one, because as you know, I do put out unabridged version of books, but before that I released the book in like one or two chapter uploads until I finish it. And I think I got to like chapter four and that's uh, the next clip I'm going to play. And that's where I got to the point where I was almost done narrating books completely. I was getting burnt out because of it. I put it on the back burner didn't touch it for six months, came back, finished narrating the book on Patreon, then released the unabridged one on the channel. But the slam poetry thing, I want to I get more into the crazy plots and everything, but I want to get a little bit of the fun out of the way. Everybody can have a few laughs here, because during my narration of chapter four, I believe, I had to break in and let my listeners know that I was not having a stroke I was reading what the book said. Uh, I'm not sure if Alex just has this super genius uh, writer brain and I'm just I just can't comprehend his genius or if he was just trying to fill in pages to reach the 400 page quota. Either way, he wrote a Jason X book that got published. I didn't. So it's not my place to, you know, super criticize or act like I'm better or armchair author this book. Uh, but I do want to play a clip. It's another thing that sounds like slam poetry. And I do interject that I'm not having a stroke during this. And uh, yeah, check it out. And uh, once we're done with this laugh, we'll get into some more, the real meat and the plot of Jason X Death Moon. Roll it. The following is an extract from the Books of Shatter, or a meditation on the Moon Camp Massacre by Jonas Frosty. But that would come later. She's animated, lacerated, laminated, lit from inside like a pumpkin queen, harnessed Venus, just another pro-honey oiled and suctioned, lubed and laced. Many more where you came from, sweetheart. One more pony in the rodeo. It was clear by now to all areolas apparent that nobody was in the mood to count the iridescent hues of rainbows. They were here to fuck. Sin lurked indisputably behind the slightest nervous twitch. Subliminal serpents slurped daiquiris in the parlor's jungle glades. Suddenly, hot and smoke and pariahs were oozing out of hidden nooks and crannies in the shrubbery. Entire units of blue-eyed cowboys and cyberites of the James Dean cult crawled on polymorphing limbs to the crevices, cunts and crooked limbs jammed in their astounded faces. In the Naugahyde 
seraglio formerly referred to as the den, lubricated hustlers of every description snatched eagerly at fluffs of popcorn and cotton candy tossed to gasping lips as they built the cybernetic shrine to Elsa Lancaster. Even jaded veterans of post-apocalyptic braggadocio wars, my mutation is bigger than your teensy chromosomal neck, lashed lascivious tongues to the mast in preparation for the storm to come. Meanwhile, back at the haunted castle, the caretaker formerly known as Igor renounces his trade in the abased brain business and takes to smuggling the pineal glands of certain rare species of hermaphrodite found only in South American jungle settings. Lurching forward on his one good leg, dragging that decrepit piece of meat idly forward, stick pins in it, it's useless, slyly watching for the moment when Master drops his guard. Igor plumps down the pineal glands in a big vat, sizzles them with acid, fries them up something fierce, and serves the gland up red hot. Nervous first-timers experience telepathic oneness with disincarnate con men. Lubricious tune-ups with interstellar KY expose them to lewd comments and alien probing. Wrapped in perennial mummy bandages, Elsa Lancaster cuts together an acting job not yet equaled, in the live trade, anyway. Robot cameras cycle and recycle the same lights and spectacle. Melting, contraptional algorithms rewind heads like tapeworms. Revved up biofilms ready to party. Bring it on. In his unfinished final novel, The Last Tycoon, F. Scott Fitzgerald says that the whole proposition, movies, alpha, omega, all points covered. So here they are again, digging it up like it's the Garden of Eden. Spades clinking on Eve's clavicle. Dull smacks on Adam's hip bone. Sundered black earth everywhere. Any questions so far? No? You with the hat. You can sit down. All right. Places, everyone. Places. Roger Bordeaux wrings his hands with insane hunger. We're making a real porn flick here, people. Yummy and quick. True, we use rubbery flesh, but we've got authentic values. The taut pink tip of the nipple, so close you could touch it. Those polymers, so fresh they squeak. Those wet dreams, they were mine once, maybe still are. Hot spotlights, Vaseline lens, body creams, and color fields forever. Those lights, and hey, did I tell you about the gaffer? He's hung like a stallion, ready for love. Not to mention the angel of death. She's raring to shoot a scene or two. The scary skeleton bitch. Stars we got lined up, and we keep them coming. We rock the space between blinks, folks. It's all we do. All in all, it's a stellar weld of a cast and crew. Should be a huge hit. The crystal shit is being fueled as we speak in tongues. Pardon me while I try one of these cigars here. What's the picture, you may ask? Well, it's a remake of an old universal icon. A heroine of sorts. The Bride of Frankenstein. And Cinemascope. We belong dead. Only this time, it's personal. He smiles his best Ed Wood smile. Ah, yes, let us pause now, rolling back on our haunches whilst ghastly waves of memory lurch to the surface. Boris Karloff, Elsa Lancaster, green nausea, white terror, the electric shock of horror on her face while ghoulish lights played against her pale white flesh. Curses, rejection, the monster's despair, and a nice windmill. Nice tits, too, when you think about it. Never got to see those puppies, did you? Well, now you do. Meanwhile, your camera focus drills on me. I take it in. It makes me come, darling. All the attention gets me hot. I dribble on your boom-boom and swill champagne, my only little Hollywood Babylon. I am your swooning star. Come, gargle. Your fallen angel. Easy on the wings, darling. Your Randy s succubus. Oh, stop. Your cybernetic shrine to Elsa Lancaster. In my mummy-wrapped arms, you will find all the secrets of love and death. Screw me. Carose with me. Open your heart. Parenthetical aside, that is one organ I have never tasted, and I never drink wine. Ease it open. Let it down. Open. Let it down. Easy now. Slurp, slurp. There's a good dog's body. Hello. Meanwhile, back at the castle, it's a long way from the laboratory. Piled up silk shoulders beside his ponderous steps, 
The monster belongs to the dead. At least it's a place to belong. Who, where, electric head, streaky sister. White jets in the skull again. All these hot young lovers, they were me once too. I raise my glass in benediction and honor to your health. Godspeed. Get yours, get some. Because it's all true. If you'd wanted me, I lay somewhere else. Spastic retching, gagged on cold silver microballs, decked out in nano funeral drag. If you needed me, I lay frozen in unnatural geometry, bent to take it, bend to take it. Cold ass quivers, stray hair stone cold kneeling on tile to take it, plunging blood slick down whirling cylinders to get it, packed like a bullet in hell's outer chambers to make it. Infringe my rights, pack my wound, pack my bullet. Fuck blood, blood, fuck, make it, make it. <clears throat> I can hear the mermaid swelling inch by inch. Sea serpents coming out any time. Ladies and sorority sisters. One pauses on a red stocking knee. Threads ground to wisps. Curl of guttural muscle. Four shortened sharp shock of mad muff. Winkles of pink twilight. Rug munch forceps ready. Hardened cape delivery, whispers of blue blood. Ready, Captain? Then, young guns throttle their engines, wet, ready, willing. Corporate spies roll down like PVC spiders. Get them, mace them, throttle them. Hands behind their backs, hands over their heads, arms between and around their thighs. No flesh will be spared. It's your turn next, Jimbo. Her face is lit like a cybernetic shrine to Elsa Lancaster. Korans on silver, wrapped in mystique, these girls in their outsized Greek letters. Alpha, oh my Delta Omicrome. Full force perspective, girl flesh goose pimples. High glare from cute calves, spurting, squilling out. Ram home that preposterous load, sons of Zeus. Bright-eyed Athena likes it stiff from a girl special. Nike swoosh thrills, gagged on girl juice. All good, sell me some, give me some. Sweet drops, unlock and reload. Can you get in further close up? Can you? Jam the mic in his fucking face? That mic's a fat snake menace. Lick it up, up, all of it. All that juice. Jesus fucking Christ. The other pieces move. This one stands still, pointing to the queen. You get it? Start, she commands. White moves first. Starker, she, the counselor of this camp city commands that white. Lipstick black smack. Then, behind eternal marble thighs, white knights and license, temple prostitutes giggle in digital twilight. Rock and roll, my friends, my worms. Rock, heartbreak, nastiness, lace, and leather. Imminent decay of proton coils, dominance, and heartbreak soup. All at once pink. She spread pink spread, she said. He moves, just press jower. You want hookup, sailor? You dream pie? Pussy hair tangle. Nasty protein dream pie. <clears throat> Cringing taxidermist hit the skids, foul on all sorts of lousy dope and rigmarole. Elsa Lancaster said, It's a long way from her house to the Bahas, and I've got decades of bad aesthetics waiting for offload. Pasolini daydream architecture caresses a river of black meat. Languid sybarites glide and glide. Bad animation can drag you all the way down, said Betty Boop as she vomited dark streams of the celluloid juice on the steps of the White House. Don't try it. You'll get hooked, screw it on the junk, and you'll stay there flapping your wings for all eternity while some kind of hick-ass backwards griffin sodomizes your ass. That's telling them, Boopster. Why, with that kind of moxie and an all-American know-how, we'll be cream in your galaxy, too. An aesthetic snuff-box in her Frankenstein, patronymic, yet caressed and adored lady, patted and perfumed, who was she to call herself a daughter? What star-spangled rites unfurled behind her, glorifying those American thighs? What lips? What names? What immortal hand-eye coordinate points? Where did they come from? And why were they bearing be be heads on trays like Salome in the Age of Black Mass Productions? Spherical servitors from far away, their heads pointing back, their hearts pointing forward to lubricious swirls. Don't look down. 
Abbott's work was important from the frat house to the White House to the death house and nexus searches in between important. That was no lie. Meanwhile, down in the basement, subaltern weasels got you every time and they said that freedom was free, the hoodlums. Diaphragm thighs, fearful cemetery, ain't it? Abbott scoured all databases, all track lines. No news was good news unless it was the groundlings. That very evening, Messrs. discovered the intrigue involving Augustine and one of the subaltern fuckers. It didn't make them jump, but the teeth were viral. Zap twitchy gad, she was sputtering green puck like them Venusians. Trauma ward away, no lie, like a patient anesthetized on a table. Well, anyway, we had to suture the girl and remap those coordinate points. Girl got a bad attitude. Synthetic DNA right there. Build them up. Tweak out the water, pile on the protein, and you've got yourself a golden one, son. Subway routes, ram down her throat. The old In-N-Out hotbox, snuff channel. Twerks, caps, snipper? She was good, better than anybody he had known. But he didn't know that. The minister's hands lifted him, then pushed him deeper under. Deeper than black tie dreams, Senator. We'll make a man out of you yet. Don't forget to breathe deep. God speaks to children also in dreams and by the oracles that lurk in darkness. Sometimes, however, the spiritual arouser is too acute. It's a perilous, mithratic flux between darkness and a world of hurt. Word to the wise, the hurt usually wins. The minister removes his black veil, revealing a cold void of spermscapes. Tell teaser figure eights, conduits of berserk DNA. He snuffled at the breech box ringing and flaying his hands for a little benediction. She spat on him. Spiritual arousal, she cried. You monster, you and your hideous creeping zen enzymes, you effluvium of recycled sutras, you tantric insect. There was a bird, a skeletal monster, a clatter and blink of diodes and dots. She loved it, and it loved her. Why, Henry? Because of that old Pericles jazz, no doubt. And anyway, if the bird could take it, so could he. So, she said the data was perfect, but the chick was mad. Moe meme, I'd almost forgotten Dr. Gilbert's appointment. His help, father groaned, his help will kill you. Those eyes, the logocentric spiral of them, those bedroom eyes, unusual lab work in protoplasmic cell suspension. The terminology is highly specialized and... It's a long way from the laboratory, said Elsa Lancaster in a blue silk gown, trailing down the cockle-shell Spanish moss walkway with her bow on her arm, trailing sighs and secrets, neurons and nevermores, fractal mores and deliquescent enzymes lolling around microparticles. What's up, my man? The eyes looking down from a black iron railing in old New Orleans, a harness lolling on a mannequin. Red, white, and blue quills stroking aquiline foregrounds. Black stroked thighs, the way down, formal harmonies. Strippled thighs, white thighs, those eyes, skimming ballroom across my plasma TV. Those eyes, eternal shrine to Elsa Lancaster. She was remembered, of course, from Savannah. Well, that was the original, I mean, let's face it. What was she but poor white trash that advanced frame by frame, pixel by pixel, inch by digital fucking inch? to become the lovable, huggable cartoon angel of our squeaky-clean dreams. If not that, then what? An angel to be penetrated, flummoxed, exfoliated, bent over backwards, ridden fast, and driven to final spasms later? Ride her fast and furious, said the captain. If she doesn't cooperate, give her a few slaps with the crop whip. She'll come around. I've seen this kind of filly before, and they're not easy to train. Plasma TV eyes, high definition, don't you know? Highlights on those puppies, dimpled shades, the press doting behind head grow upon hedge grow. Oh, did you see that? The cute little thing with the, yeah, that. I mean, who would have believed it? Not now, not zen, but she was beyond our formulations, our dear, dear girl. What we wanted could not be categorized or altered or besieged or bewildered, syncretized or sanitized. Little by little, dear, was the God's own delight. They crooned like minstrel drag hustlers on Mount Olympus with mock sad sack faces, gone all a void, like jaws purloined from Edvern Munch. They rolled like diabolic gamblers, bones clattering before the last dance. They rolled so as not to be seen, 
to be legendary, to be stiff and yet flexible, furled and yet unfurled, mean and yet relaxed. Those plasma TV eyes, those thighs, my Elsa. We'll make our fortunes, all of them step by step, if we have to sprawl face down in Gloria Swanson's swimming pool forever. We'll be the limp and soggy greenbacks just loosed from prison. Eyes of fire glazed once, twice, three strikes for the lady. Just give us enough time and we'll freeze Manhattan for you. Break out loose blocks of decadence as the pieces flake and free fall. Just for you, my lovely, my angel, my eternal shrine, flaked soft and fine, piece by piece. She didn't understand, coal running gimmick tree death fried. Abbott wanted the purer strain, but I think it's too late. Frozen, empiricism, concrete cell formation, this is the final floor show. Give me the eggs, damn you, windy superstitious of forced breath. Lamentations, lacrimations, horse shit. An entire Greek chorus shifts a few microns in their marble togas. Blink and you'll miss her. Call black, no gimmick, cyber culture bride. We need to take another blood sample. You know the drill. Esoteric propagation of regulatory inhibitions. Body formations all to riot. Eternal shrine to Elsa Lancaster. We need you. We need you to build the future. I don't usually do this during my narration, but I just want to let everybody know it's okay. I'm not having a stroke. I am narrating this book, Jason X Death Moon. To be used on the girls of Moon Camp Americana. Rotwang rotating blades for speed and efficiency. Anesthetic snuff box. Fornication on electrified field grids. Morphogenetic folly. Mesmerized, intoxicated by the light glancing from her eyes. As the poet says, they want out. Anywhere out of this world. To get fucked, get screwed on anything alien DNA. Biomorphic forms, chemicals, enzymes, proteins. To breed to heat, to fill with undying lust, to manifest dark strategies against architecture, to destabilize forces so criminally drained already of all life, all heat, all matter, that to vacuum forth the last chunk of matter would render them empty. If shells is what you want, shells is what you get, my friend. For transportation, celebration, alimentation, protozoic life forms breeding. You know the drill. It's a cold, unfriendly place out there in cyber. Has to be another half-breed hydrochloric gas. No answer from the hearts of space. Down in the cryocore, anesthetized just for you. Come on, that look is poison. Needless of pain in your dark eyes. White radiance, screams from burst shells. Surround sound tentacle worship. And Elsa Lancaster, we need you. The death sentence itself marked by elaborate protocols. Filigreed for death by inscrutable pixelated druids. The other pieces move. This one stands still. Start, she commands. White moves first. Stark, she commands the white. On the lowest rung of the concentric spiral forming the inner architecture of the NARS top secret moon base, an aquarium-like tank filled a space 50 foot long and 30 feet tall. Panes of shockproof synthetic plastic exerted strength great enough to resist quakes, fires, floods, and most conventional weaponry. Milky green liquid washed in slow circles around a humanoid figure, a body crisscrossed by an optic grid that tracked him day and night. Although technically the 13th rung, the area was known as the Ninth Circle. It had been built for one purpose, warehousing Jason Voorhees. <laughs> Okay, I do. I do got one more thing to interject. They were like talking about having a breakdown. I thought you almost did at one point because at, towards the end, there's another incoherent rant, and the rant ends with, "I don't know. Go read some Isaac Asimov. Leave me the fuck alone." And then it just keeps talking. And I was like, "Was that you?" And you're like, "No." It literally says that in the book. Like, yes. like it's being narrated by a guy who's narrating the tale of what happened on Death Moon. Like like a grandpa reading a kid a story, but he won't stop going into this incoherent rant about when him and his buddies used to rob a liquor store because he kind of had a crush on that girl with the blue hair. And you're like, Grandpa, is this in the story? And you have no idea because he won't give you the book because he's an angry old man who never got to hook up with Jessica. And here we are, uh, Death Moon, Jason X4. 
Betty Boop, sex stuff, and... Uh, Elsa Lancaster. What the she, fuck is this book she, even she, talking about? She played the Bride of Frankenstein. If anybody oh, I know. I got her picture on a wall in my kitchen. Yeah. I don't know about like, this book. What does that have to do with anything? For any listeners, like, this this book takes place in, like, like what is it, like, almost the year 3000 or something? 2555 or something? And they keep talking, and he keeps talking about Spongebob. Like, instead of God damn it, they'll be like... God, Spongebob or something. They do that like three times in this book. It is so bizarre. And at one part, it was like, it's asking the real questions. Something about F. Scott Fitzgerald. And who was Spongebob Squarepants? What, what the fuck? Jason. Is Jason in the, It, it kind of reminded me of part two where Jason's strapped to a table for like half the book. Like, where, where is he? Yeah, I mean, this whole book is just so confusing. And what, what really sucks is the prologue is classic Jason. Like, you get Jason kills, uh, the story of Jason, etc., etc. But then, after the prologue, we get into the chapter and start hearing about the core cars and the goobly boobly's or and whatever. And the cat people and the techno priest who are you doing cyber sex. And I'm like, what? Was this a completely different book they just, like, threw Jason into? We do get a cool scene later, and I think that'll be a clip when we get to that part of the discussion where, if I remember correctly, Jason, a cloned version of Jason, regular Jason, fights against Uber Jason. Oh, yeah, it, he has a bag on his head, so it's literally part two versus part ten Jason. Yeah, so we'll get to that in a bit and play that clip. Oh, but they like, fight on Freddy Krueger's dock, like in Freddy versus Jason. I know you were just like, what the fuck? Well, how, how are they fighting at the location he fought Freddy Krueger? Is Freddy Krueger in this universe, too? Yeah, so we're going we're gonna to work our way to that, but we're going to try to break down exactly what the hell's going on in this book. So, as we mentioned, J.J., you know, he's, like, going against the government or trying to get into the mainframe, whatever. You got your group of teenagers uh, that have, like, just been too rowdy and rambunctious, so they're going to get sent to this summer camp on this death moon. Does it... Does, I can't remember. Does it explain... Uh, how Uber Jason got from where he was at the end of part three to to where he was on uh, Death Moon. Did they send him yeah, there? Yeah. Um, so apparently the government sends Captain Gupta and his crew to go take down Jason. And I could have sworn he got taken down at a movie theater, but he's in a ship. And they, they use these robot spiders to spin a web around Jason. And I, I'm assuming they just took him from that ship to moon camp in a laboratory that's under the lake where they're making zombie versions of Jason's mom. Because there's a tombstone under the water when a girl falls into it. It's just all over the place. And while this is going on, you're all... Why does so mom have a head? Exactly. And there's like <laughs> Nazi... This Nazi woman is one of the counselors or something, but she's she used to be a Nazi that was cryogenically frozen. And it, like I couldn't tell if they were sending these privileged kids, uh, troublemakers, there just so they could be killed by Jason as some kind of experiment to make him a weapon. Uh, I I never really could grasp what was going on exactly. Why why were these experiments going on with Jason? at this on this moon and why did they set up the camp there did you figure that part out no it gets even weirder because the the girl whose dad built the camp she helps him with the blueprints and her character is never mentioned again but when jj is hacking into the mainframe she's randomly one of the women being tortured by that nazi woman and then he has to rescue her from there and then they end up getting in jail at the end and i'm like what the fuck is she doing there she should be the last person in this camp like was the government trying to cover its tracks by locking up anyone who knew about this but only oh, if they're young and sexy so that's why jj was in prison at the beginning of part five is because he was imprisoned in this one no i think they explain in part five that he was in prison because they were covering it up but that's not explained in this book it's only hinted. Like, it doesn't even say he's in a jail cell. It says he's in a place with, like, dots of light while he's having a threesome with a C-3PO robot. That's never explained where the fuck they got that robot either. And the cat, the cat uh, aliens that dress in Victorian clothing. It's There's so much in this book. I They're wish watching all this on TV. 
Yeah, I wish I could explain more detail of what this book is like, but if it seems like we're all over the place talking about it, it's because we're trying our hardest to grasp onto something. Uh, what do you got in your notes? What, what's a topic we can bring up from your notes? Oh my God, the fact that when they tell camp stories, it's not camp stories about Jason, it's camp stories about a movie that Jason was in. Like in this book, Friday the 13th is a movie series based on things that actually happened at Crystal Lake. And then the camp directors, to make it seem more realistic, they literally pay a guy named Cunningham to dress like Crazy Ralph and drink and tell people, uh, don't stay away from the lake. It's got a death curse. And they're like, you dumb bastard. This place was built six months ago. What are you talking about? <laughs> An old lake. <laughs> that was, that was kind of funny. <laughs> like, what are you even talking about? This, this doesn't even make sense. Well, but he does get killed like Crazy Ralph in part two. But he gets killed by a Jason that I swear has a hockey mask. Not compared to the Jason later that has a bag on his head. Not compared to the Jason that's Uber Jason in a lab. So there's like four Jasons running around this camp and only two of them actually meet each other. Yeah, it, It's so confusing because you don't even realize it. I think the only reason Sean got it is because he's listened to it three times. Three times. Number one, you narrated <laughs> it and I was doing you a solid. I was like, I'm going to listen to every book on your channel because I, I was actually curious. Second time. No, no, no. Second time was the solid because we were going to do this episode and then we were trying to get the author and then it's like a year later and I had to read it for the third time. So I'm trying to build racket on a rooftop and I'm listening to this bullshit and they're like, Campbell, did you got the blueprints right in? I'm like, what? Robosex. What? I'm not having a stroke. I'm listening to a guy having a stroke reading this book where the guy's oh, writing it is having a stroke. Or sexy. Oh, oh, not to mention that Jason kills uh, futuristic Ray Charles in a club. Oh, my God, yes. <laughs> yes, that does happen. Like, it's like Jason gets killed, and then you turn the page to the next chapter. And no, he, it's got like, sucked oh, into, he got no. sucked into a black hole. But then the next chapter, oh, no, he didn't get sucked into a black hole because he's here. He's back. And... Uh, yeah, I guess we could play that clip, even though it's late in the book. Uh, this blind guy. I don't know why. This chapter makes no sense. I have no idea why it was even included, other than to have some more Jason kills. But yes, towards the end of the book, this happens. Roll it, I guess. Chapter 16. Darcy Bricole was about to get some. He could feel it, worked up into that, curled up like a thousand reps with some sweet yet painful instruments of self-actualization. Into the game, the chase, the catch and release, the relay of torsion and dressage that followed, the wailing away with blue canes, the unusual variations on the age-old practice of mating. He'd been reading a book lately, a kind of fractal encyclopedia. Words spilled out, followed by linkages, designs, stories of Sinbad the Sailor. It didn't look like the menu to Moonburger, let's put it that way. When a giant walked by, a giant with a metal face. Who was this, some joker from a traveling carnival planet? A freaky hybrid? Jason Voorhees? No, it couldn't be. Jason pushed his fist through Darcy's face, claimed his brain, then looked up. The diners scattered like guilty peasants after a government overthrow, but Jason was on top of them. He was all over that. Forks flew through corneas with a nasty sound, cherry tomatoes exploding under the top back molar. Gourmands flailed beneath the shredded remains of recently unionized toaster ovens. Jaded hookers ran screaming. Burning iron pokers stuck through their backs. Electrified waiters pummeled the air. Jason threw the waiters in a pile, tossed a bottle of cognac on the pile, lit a match to it. The waiters' bodies exploded in fire. Jason sniffed the air quizzically. It was good, like the mesquite bricolettes back at camp. Before the hurt began, before they killed Mommy, silent sulk, rage of the black resin, eruption of the fractal bug jitters, electric circuits shattered Jason's body, trailing full spectrum flare guns. Jason's heart is getting big, pumping fat wads of the black resin. His heart is getting mad, so mad it could explode, because they were everywhere, everywhere he looked, the static, the meat. 
the ones his mommy warned him about, the ones that looked like strangers, that punished him and pushed him aside, that let him drown. He would never forget that gurgle, 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 and then the letting go and the discovery, the rediscovery of his body still alive, only changed, not like before. Kill for me, mommy. Kill for mommy. They were interchanging faces, forcibly connecting and unconnecting, flesh from flesh, particle from particle, shreds of optic nerves strung out on thin, shivering, hypnotic lines. Kill for me. Kill for mommy. Kill forever. They can never kill you. And he was still dead, again, and he kept coming, again, because he felt the limit. They were the limit. They were the walls, the walls of flesh, the walls that had to be torn, ripped, rendered, wrung piece from piece. Jason was the limit, Mr. Fuck. Swish, swoosh, and tinkle of cocktail glasses. Digital rewind. Courtesies are summarily exchanged among sinister tuxedoed guests. A well-deserved, long-overdue respite from work. An opportunity to show off, to rinse off limbs caked with gook, to rise like splendid swans folded in post-industrial pockets, to demonstrate that they are still women, to argue that they are still men, to avoid going home alone tonight again. The ancillary work crew attached to Moonbase inhabited their own miniature town. Unlike the biosphere in design, it resembled more the endless gray buildings of the Prevac Cold War. The grim hives utilized for sleeping, bathing and eating, and nothing more. Where sex was a luxury most could not afford. Except that, unlike those buildings, the row upon row of badly insulated boxes carrying the drift of raw onions from unit to unit. Moontown only looked hard on the outside, like a ghost town with only one spectral flickering gas station, blue flash of exploded octane. Inside, at least for tonight, was a whole different story. There was entertainment. Not just any entertainment, either. Some of the finest talents, the choicest artistes from planet Vegas, had come to pay their trade. To celebrate the final steps of the Biodome's construction, after nine Earth-2 years, the moon colony was ready to open its doors in earnest. The banners flew everywhere, thanking the workers for the nice jobs they'd done. Thank you, nice workers, for the nice jobs you've done. Nice. Let's say that word, nice, again. Feels good on your teeth, doesn't it? Congratulating them for the struggles they'd overcome, the hardships faced, the sheer overwhelming endurance necessary to bring the project off their willingness to forego union negotiations until after the grand opening. John Robertson sat at the direct fusion piano in the impromptu ballroom, fashioned out of gaffer's tape, smoke, mirrors, and utility fog. From where the audience sat, Robertson looked like a man floating on his own private cloud, on his very own moon. Robertson, however, could not see the crowd. Robertson was blind, had always been blind. Unlucky enough to have been born during one of the quiet revolutions that routinely brought life on Earth, too, to a screeching halt. A screeching, screaming halt, fast as a cartoon shark, faster than an anime outbreak in the Warner Brothers Looney Tunes backlot. As politicians reassessed their priorities and gamers covertly renewed expired licenses, Robertson never received proper medical treatment for his condition. He languished, cursing his luck. As a result, he'd grown to manhood with the song in his heart and a chip on his shoulder. A microchip, actually, embedded in his clavicle bone. Of his bones were coral made, and those are pearls that were his eye teeth. How are you all doing tonight? He asked from the cloud. Scattered applause, whoops, hollers, yells. Play us something we can dance to! Yelled one inebriate, anxious to get his drink on. I know just the thing. Robertson breathed into the microphone. Yeah, he was good, knew it, too. His neo-Irish voice and good looks always took him further than he might have gone on his own. And the blindness didn't hurt, either. Sometimes he suspected that it actually improved his luck with the other sex. They didn't get so freaked out, so scared. Not as scared as they should be. Long, tapered fingers tickle the ivories. This song really brings me back, Robertson said. 
all the way to the Microsoft quarantine. You all remember that? They remembered, all right, just didn't want to be reminded. Don't bum us out, boss, yelled a heckler, a long-throated, silk-shirted young black man, fresh from the Muhadeen cluster. He tired of the neo-Arabian rough trade and wanted nothing more than early retirement, cheap whores and plenty of the old dark sauce, some of that Harold and Kumar shit. You know we don't like those sad songs. Oh, this isn't sad. It's a little melancholy, but it's not sad. Robertson began to play the first few bars of Death Moon. Ah, oh, sweet. That was some of the necro, and more where that came from. He shifted his spine on the piano bench, smiling like a dazed neo-Irish Ray Charles, a gentleman, and a dog among dogs, a favorite during the last debauched days of the Microsoft quarantine, in which entire cities had been declared trade-free zones while festering like open sores. Death Moon took from the Cole Porter source and added a special sauce. It was hip, it was fly, it was where they were this Saturday night. Peel back the windows, Robert sang. Tear down the walls. Open your heart to that crazy death moon. His suit glowed with the fractal backscatter of a million show tunes. Couples glazed on each other's eyes with subliminal frosting. Magic. The rhythm was a slow waltz, subtly infused with African polyrhythms. Spectral scatter off the white radiance. On the swooping vapor hollow screen gathering behind Robertson's head, slow drops gathered a water ballet. Right in time to the music. Drop a dime on that beat. Splash. Jason Voorhees approached the gates of Moon City. Rude graffiti of newly crusted blood. Automatic sewing needles skitter through lymph. The same angry eyes, the same strong, handsome jaw structure. More than preserved more than enhanced, ripped and fueled, and ready for extreme death. No, not extreme death, motherfucking ice-cold death, and you could push that in your asshole and smoke it up your pipe. Jason punched through the airlock. The airlock gave with just the faintest tinge of defeat, like a balding earth bitch who prefers to go quietly, leaking a millennium-wide trail of the foul yellow liquid. Beyond the airlock lay the stairs, and more stairs, stairs that went up, stairs that went down, stairs leading to other stairs, more stairs than seemed feasible or reasonable, really, considering the access issues they posed. At the top of stairline B-17, music was playing, jazz cocktail for prepared fusion piano, John Robertson singing his heart out for all the ladies, hello ladies, and all the men keeping one eye out for the ladies and another eye out for the smooth piano man. Just because he was blind didn't mean he wasn't trouble. Curved dome awash with stellar light, white radiance of eternity, funeral contagion chords of George Crumb, peace and love hacked to bits behind overwhelming forces, shatter, break, immense of the digital text. At first, all Robertson picked up on was the commotion, Couples had stopped moving, threads unwound from other threads, polymers took rest breaks, then glasses began to fall. He could hear micro tinkle loudly, painfully tympanic membranes vibrating like sepulchral seashells pitched at five times the volume threshold an ordinary human sustains without, whence, permanent damage. But that was how Robertson saw through the chip on his shoulder, through the pearly gateway and beyond. Two, smells of wet, ripe carnage. Serving trays heavy with champagne offloaded, used as weapons. Clack and crackle of things breaking, the hiss of atmosphere sealant, like a giant popping the cork back on some big fucking champagne bottle. This was how he saw through the swirls of sound, the vaulting chaos as he stood up, closed the fusion piano and waited for a signal. Sparky, he said, summoning the canine unit. The artificial dog rolled itself up at Robertson's feet. Sparky, what's going on? Sparky, the canine unit, spoke in a rapid gibberish composed of scraps of neo synaglis and the latest additions to the universal binary code. He was the best friend Robertson had ever had. And he wasn't even human, wasn't even animal, was in fact a perfectly functioning machine. A bio-friendly, they were calling him. What do you say, boy? Boy? 
Robertson heard the signal fading out, getting weaker and weaker. A high-pitched hum vaulted the sound spectrum in his left ear. He winced. That was enough to give him blinding headaches most days when the thing went off, when it malfunctioned, leaving him stranded, alone, feeling pretty fucking useless. As death carved a swad through the diners on a straight path to the performing artist, Robertson tickled the keys one last time. His head came off with one sleek blow from Jason's machete. The head hit the piano top, rolled over, slid past a cluster of fruit shapes in memory of Hieronymus Bosch, and finally smacked against a leg from the nearest table. It was still grinning. His last thought had been a happy one, a bit cliched, but happy nonetheless. What a terrible thing this is, thought Robertson, to lose one's head. Jason looked up. The partiers faced him from behind, an impromptu barricade, cobbled from chairs, tables, chandeliers, odd bits of broken glass, fractal curls of the utility fog, and unknown substances that later defied the most sophisticated analysis known to civilized man. Whatever firepower they could summon, these party-goers summoned it. They weren't military ops, were not trained in special weaponry or the cryptic art of the bone jigsaw. They were just regular guys, ordinary women and men, off-earth stockloaders, utility fog engineers, random homosexuals looking for interplanetary rough trade, one or two, workers from the dust planet of Syrinx, five actually, aged social workers there to pour away the last miserable moments of their miserable lives behind tall glasses of the blue death. One, be patient. All they wanted was a break, a little ray of hope, some cold jazz on the moon at the start of the six-month night. Surely that wasn't too much to ask. Jason Voorhees did not have an opinion. He did have a machete, a brand new upgrade, and millennia of built-up rage, primed for detonation, waiting seeking the final floor show all right i said we're gonna do this like a sandwich so i gotta end this with something else i liked um okay jason in the city killing club patrons as uber jason okay that was kind of interesting it made no goddamn sense and i don't know why it's added and i don't know why jason uh maybe he went into the black hole and got knocked with something else that was in there got knocked back out of the black hole and <laughs> end up in a city um but it's kind of like jason takes manhattan in the future i don't know i mean that was kind of interesting i mean there were good things in this book it's just like it's almost like it was written like this was a book that was similar to an eddie azard comedy special he makes really good points, but then he'll go off on a tangent and never go back to what he was talking about. Or if he yeah. does come back, it's just, it's fragmented. It's like ADHD. It's all over the place. So there are a lot of good things in this book if they were left to marinate. There's like multiple recipes going on here, and you end up with a kitchen that's on fire. Uh, I just... If any of these ideas had been taken and fleshed out, this could have been a really good book. But all of it mixed in together, it's like when you're building a recipe with whatever you have in the cabinet, and it's like lima beans with rotten bananas and cabbage and some meat you can't identify that you found in the back of the freezer. You know what I mean? Like, that is what this is. This is hodgepodge. It is it is hodgepodge, and it needs a lot of garlic if we're going to swallow it down. And then when you do finally get some summer camp Jason scenes, it like some girl like gets teleported into the mix or something. I can't remember how that happened, but like a lot of it happens off page, like off screen. You find you get after fact knowledge of what happened. Uh, you know, the people at the camp actually getting killed. The Nazi lady's death, I think, was pretty good. Um but there was a cool scene where one of the survivors is swimming under that lake or whatever and ends up in an altercation with the, the zombie clone of Jason's mom. You know, that if it was her actual corpse, it would be like dust by now. So I guess it's a clone. It's not been decapitated. Uh, so there is a scene with uh, Pamela 
you know, fighting with it with this or with somebody in the book. That's it's neat, but again, it makes no sense. There's just so many threads to this story, so many plot threads that just don't get re- resolved, and I just can't follow it, no matter how hard I try. Uh, do you remember teenage? Did you ever watch Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the '80s cartoon? No. Okay. Anybody, anybody who did, who's watching, listening, uh, the scene where the kids get in trouble, they're like driving a hover car in the future. And it totally reminds me of the punk kids from, uh, Dimension X on Ninja Turtles. You'll remember that if you watch the cartoon, um, they like go through a billboard sign or something but there's like meetings with rich people talking about who's going to be sent to the camp. Uh, the camp ends up being more of like an experimentation, like laboratory. And you got all this different shit going on. Like we're going to have to have a second episode uh, in the future revisiting this book just to cover everything. Because there's no way that we can cover it all today because uh, a lot of it's not going to come to us. It'll come to us later. But I would say there's at least 50 plot threads in this book. And they even include the president of, I guess, the New World being like, Mr. President, there's people getting killed at the camp. And he just does cocaine and is like, okay. And then he's never addressed again. That's just, well, what was that even about? Like, he just starts cutting uh, portraits of other presidents out of the frames while he threatens to kill his secretary. And then it just goes, that's it. That That is President Fitzgerald. Like, what like wh- why was this even in the what did what did this add to anything? You got a you got a woman that's wanting to become a famous actress, but what she's doing is like the techno porn. You got well, she, the, she's a porno actress, but then she becomes a reporter for a TV station. Yeah, it, it's just, were those two characters, or did she is she uh, working two part time jobs? Like we're gonna come back when we get to episode fifty. Episode fifty of Out of Print Slashers podcast. We're going to revisit Death Moon. I'm going to bring in Slasher Pepper for real this time, not a joke. I'm going to bring in uh, maybe somebody else that's listened to it. We're going to try to get Alex himself, Alex S. Johnson. And we're going to have a deep dive into this book with more people, more opinions, and see how it goes then. Episode 50 will be Jason X Death Moon Revisited. Uh, we'll at least have Slasher Pepper on because he's read the book as well and has some strong opinions. And uh, we'll see if we can get some more people that's listened to come on and discuss it with us. Um, but I do want to, before we end it, play probably one of the coolest scenes in the book. And that's what we talked about earlier. Sackhead Jason versus Uber Jason. Uh, it's a pretty cool scene, uh, regardless of how manic the book is. So... Without further ado, the final clip of this episode, uh, what do you say? Yep, roll it. Jason stopped just past the event horizon, the place where the brain spilled into inky nothing. His outline shape streaked, phosphorescent silver bubbles popping up in the semi-darkness. Suspiria's black queen, born again through her only misbegotten son. Within the shape ride the wilderness of plasma blobs, the last signals of semiotic death. Jason Voorhees was losing his edge. Edges. His boundaries snapped back and forth in biological space, a glitch in virtuality, or so it would appear. At some point he broke into two different monster planes, canted slightly off register to one another, like an ancient Prevac four-color comic separation. Then Jason Voorhees stepped away, from Uber Jason. Conceptually speaking, only Pink could handle this turn of events. She had absorbed so many personalities by this point that she finally understood the scriptural story of the Gobberdine swine as a literal walking around fact. She was Legion and so was Jason. Whatever Jason Voorhees was, had been, would become, lurked around the edges of the drive kernel, peeling off layers like some fucked up onion. They stood facing one another, gunmen in an old spaghetti western. On the one side of the gallery, Jason Voorhees, that sod of the earth who wore a burlap bag with eye holes cut into it to hide his hideous visage, to mask his ugly yawp, to replace the bag with a hockey mask and become an icon, Classico, the gunslinger stood his ground. 
At the other end, the Uber Jason, a product of bad science and scandalously inappropriate technology, mirrored his ancestors' movements. The Ace of Spades. Remember, it's the only card you need. In quantum terms, the two were identical. The wave and particle aspects of an electron momentarily pasted on the same page. Would they even recognize one another? Both tilted their heads in a quizzical, Jason-esque motion. Feel your hand, Pilgrim. Neither moved forward. The Uber Jason raised his machete in the air as if to strike. Jason did likewise. The air between them a ghost fog. A thick glowing yellow substance flickered through with lightning streaks. Things were born and dying there. Eldritch spawn bred from the shadow of a moment. Some arcane process whispered dialogue. Closed two pieces of one soul. Then suddenly his machete, reaping the air, the Uber Jason rushed forward into the fog. Jason did likewise. For a moment they were lost together like some spooky ballet of the blind. Strange things were happening in that murk, I tell you. Uncanny things not meant to be things. Jason Voorhees type things. For a moment, the entire original campground from the first Friday the 13th movie rose full bore into the quantum wasteland, the throne of pandemonium raised in hell. Lucifer himself might have approved. The pier upon which Jason had fought Freddy Krueger, the claw-fingered dark knight of the Chaos Gods, this was their new battlefield, the scene of a final desperate standoff between machine and man, hardware and software. More was at stake here than the future of Moon Camp, much more. Camp within the net of subliminal movements, strung together between the two like a chain of beads. The universe performed a difficult calculus, spinning the chamber, making a choice, or so it would appear. Then again, the wave and particle aspects of an electron could never be tracked simultaneously. One or the other will appear in the final readouts. Then again, Jason Voorhees was clearly charging his upgraded twin into the murk where the decision would be made. Spin, spin, meter metal, upgrade her flesh. The plasma storm concentrated. JJ, Amanda, and Pink watched in eternal awe as the fog became a sheet of ice, shattered into a billion frozen crystals, a glass wall, shatter. Jason and his machine mate slammed around the wall like Virchok players on the Mandelbrot. Big Jason struck little Jason in the shoulder. The streak of sliced flesh streamed with tiny white worms, maggots. The blade flashed again, opening Jason where his stomach might have been. More maggots, a storm system blaze of the little buggers. A big free simulcast of blade cuts, the machete crisscrossed micrometers of clothing still clinging to Jason's body. The industrial work shirt, the stained blood, spattered black pants, the black boots shiny with visceral slime, walking puke. A dangerous meeting of simple-minded organisms, a maggot mound that moves slowly, inexorably towards Big Brother. His clothing cleaved. Jason's maggot-ridden corpse began to shake loose as he advanced, leaving little pools of white maggot protein smeared across the basin's slick surface. Tiny, circulous, pallid, incidental sculpture shaped by chaos. J.J. felt his last meal begin to rise. He looked over at Amanda. Amanda let go of his hand and backed away, shaking her head. Oh, oh no you don't, she said. J.J. let go. His vomit rained down on the floor in technicolor hues. This was worse than any age trip. Worse than any wrong turn in virtual downtown. Quantum reality was duking it out with the artificial paradise squad, and the Quanti were winning. Oh, gross, he muttered. I got it on my hair. His dreads dripped with the vomit. Amanda took another step back. Big Jason looked at them. They froze. Now he was walking toward them. As he moved, Big Jason absorbed his maggot-laden twin. The wall shattered. The maggots resolved into nano-ants. A silver stream of them pouring over Jason's body. Jason was expanding in sophistication, in intelligence, cunning, ultimate menace. 
a walking dark star, a dead world come to life, a thing of evil, more potent than any yet known, badder than Satan, more merciless than Jehovah, able to spawn multiple franchises with a single kill, silent, unstoppable, and very, very dead. What was his secret? How did he reform himself so freely? What were his powers? Did they come from God, Satan, Mr. Bean, or possibly the old Muppet Show? Jason himself is incurious. If you were an unstoppable undead serial killer with limitless potential for the old death, would you be curious who made you? Or would you just lift the old machete, clench it in your bloody fist, and say, It's slaying time! So this is what happens to Jason at the present time. He is popped, poked, peppered with tiny emblems, secret signs, cryptoglyphic typography. Jason was not just expanding in strength, in might of brain and heft of brawn. He was blowing up, exploding, melting down to the size of a very small mouse. Then Jason was a blip on the final radar, and over. Time for another game of the Virchok, folks. That'll be 1,000 credits. Please pay up front, and thank you for your cooperation with this government of the new American Republic, where good people send better people to die in strange lands over cruel and hateful ideologies shared only by the tiniest minority among the good people. The little enclave known as the techno-priesthood fade to black. If you want to see actual footage of what the fight was between Jason 2 and Jason 10, you remember that scene in um, Jason Takes Manhattan where that guy's punching Jason and beating him up and the guy just goes, take your best shot, motherfucker, and just gets his head punched off? I feel like that's pretty much part 10, <laughs> Jason, versus part 2, because part 2, Jason, is flesh, and the other one is metal and literally has nanites running through his brain and can repair himself. I just, I don't really see how that fight can go any other way. I, I, there is no possible version of Jason versus Jason, I can see where Jason two wins that fight. It, it was fun though. It was it was nice little throw in for fans. I'll give them that. I'm actually yeah. surprised at how non negative I've been <laughs> in this discussion. But when we revisit it in episode fifty, which is just four episodes away, uh, that might change when we have more opinions being thrown around. And uh, we'll, we'll get a we'll get a bullet list of notes of story threads and stuff to to check off the list as we go. As far as rating this book, I got I'm only gonna give it what I'm giving it because I don't want to be a total dickhead. But I'm gonna give it half a star out of five stars, and that's just because it hey, it brought up some interesting ideas, but it had no follow through. And I feel like probably a third of this book was just random words the guy wrote on the page just to fill in the 400-page quota. That's why I wish Alex would come on here and talk with us because there might be something deeper going on that we just can't comprehend. And he might be able to explain it to us and it could click, you know, and be like, oh, I see what you were doing with that. Um, So Alex S. Johnson – if for some reason you listen to the podcast, watch it. Uh, we would love to interview you about this book. Uh, kudos to you for stamping your place in the history of Friday the 13th. Uh, I could see you had so many ideas. I wish it was better, better executed, and I wish I understood it better, but I just don't – I can't grasp a lot of what you were going for. So I would love, I'd love the chance to talk to you and have it answered um what do you rate it surprisingly enough two out of five i mean i have read a lot worse books than this a a lot worse than this i mean this book it did things none of the other jason books did uh, for jason x um it wasn't just military people the entire time wasn't just experiments the whole time they tried to do a camp they tried to show what the future's like you know i do feel like you you said this once or twice where it seems almost like a Tarantino where it jumps around and it, it was a little playful with it. Like I said, grandpa reading the kid a story. Um, it, it wasn't boring. It, it's weird. It doesn't make a lot of sense. I wish it had gone in different directions, but I wasn't bored. And when it comes to a book or a movie, 
if I'm constantly checking my watch, I'm going to give it a low rating. Now, if it is a really bad horror movie like Troll 2, but I'm at least laughing at a couple parts, you're going to get a better rating from me because I'm entertained for good or ill. This yeah. book does entertain me for good or ill. So, you know, I make I make a lot of jokes about this book being like really, really bad, but it's it's honestly not the worst thing. I wish it made more sense. You know, like you said, maybe I just don't get it. Um, but I honestly, I give it a two out of five. It's entertaining. Not the best Jason book, but, um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm happy to have this in the series. It does make Hell Lake seem so much better, though. It really does. Uh, and- I disagree. I didn't like Hell Lake. I actually find this more entertaining than Hell Lake. Reading it for the third time, I can say that. And I read Hell Lake twice. Hell Lake... At least this Jason acted like Jason, and hell, like Jason, I don't know what Jason was doing in that book. He could teleport in that one, too, through TV screens, but that's, yeah. We may one day, like our first, like, seven or eight episodes of the podcast, we were still finding our groove, and, uh, you know, we may revisit the first few episodes, and Hell Lake was one of them. Because I think there's a lot more to be said about it. Uh, Dream Dealers is another one that I would like to uh, rediscuss and bring the author back for that. Uh, But we will revisit Jason X Death Moon in episode 50. Uh, Not sure what the next episode is going to cover. Maybe one of the movie novelizations. Um, Perhaps the Texas Chainsaw Massacre uh, novelization. We haven't done that one yet, have we? We haven't. And I got more. I got stuff. I got stuff to say about that. And after the slash, okay, yeah, we'll uh, episode forty-seven of Out of Print Slashers. We'll be discussing the Texas Chainsaw Massacre novelization of the two thousand and one remake by Stephen Hand. That's gonna. That be- was my first horror movie, so I got some serious opinions. As far as casting characters for Death Moon. I really don't. I, I got nothing. I got nothing. Kane Hodder, Jason, all the way. Um, well, it's hard to say because we didn't really get time to marinate with the characters before they would just die, disappear, come back into it. I mean, it's right. Okay, I will say this. It's it, this is a weird thing I'm about to say. I have never cast a cartoon as a real person, <laughs> but did did you watch the Godzilla 1998 cartoon? Some some of them, yeah. That one guy on the team. I can't remember what his name was. He has the dreadlocks. Uh huh. Him. I would have casted him as JJ because he was kind of the tech guy that was always fucking around with Dr. Craven's equipment. He had that fun personality that I feel like would have really been good for JJ in this. I think I would cast for the evil Nazi lady, Jane Lynch. Um, or. Oh, no. Miss Trunchbull from Matilda. Yeah, yeah. Ah. I- I was just thinking Jane Lynch because she's got that resting bitch face. I, I love Jane Lynch. Don't she ain't got the physique, right. though. It gotta be she's big bl- and strong. Yeah, but she's blonde and white and everything. Perfect Nazi uh, character. She can play a villain. I don't know. I don't know. May, or uh, who played the female villain in the Rocky and Bullwinkle movie? I never saw that. Her. She was in a lot of movies, too. Um, anyways, that, that's about all I can cast for it. Uh, Castillo, Dr. Castillo, probably get somebody eccentric like Jeff Goldblum or something like that. Um, that's about all I got for casting. But I, you know, I will up my score to a star and a half out of five instead of a half a star. Because you're right, it did do some creative things, and we did get the Jason versus Jason fight. It's just... There's actually a camp in this one. Yeah, I just... The camp just seemed like it went by so fast, and most of it happened off-page, but we're going to revisit the book, so the discussion's not over. Uh, Still a lot to be said about Jason X Death Moon, and we'll do that in episode 50. But we'll be back very soon with episode 47 where we're going to be talking about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Uh, Be sure to check out the new podcast on the channel, Slash Tracks News. Uh, Also, check out the latest episode of Slash Tracks, where it's Mystery Science Theater with a horror twist. Uh, The last last two episodes, we riffed on Child's Play 3, 
and Hellraiser Revelations. And the next episode, we're going to be riffing Freddy's Revenge and Nightmare on Elm Street 2. Uh, whenever you go to watch these episodes, uh, some of the episodes we can show the full movie on YouTube with our riff commentary. Uh, like Hellraiser Revelations, we're able to show the movie. But with Child's Play 3 and some other episodes, uh, click check the link in the description. And there will be a link to uh, Google Drive where you can stream the entire episode with the full movie included with the commenta uh, riff commentary track playing. You're going to get a lot of laughs. You can join me and Alex as we uh, roast and tear shitty horror movies to pieces. Um, but uh, for now, be sure to, if you're a patron, hop over to After the Slash podcast where me and Sean are going to be shooting the shit for a good 20, 30 minutes. Anything and everything is on the table. Uh, no, no bullet points. It's just going to be a fun discussion. Be excellent to each other. Thank you for watching. And until next time, take care. I. Oh, you don't. You got a better tagline than that. Come on. Um. Evil gets an upgrade. Uh. Jason X death I'm just, I'm just reading your screen at this point. <laughs> If this one doesn't scare you, Betty Boop and uh, Elsa Lancaster will film a porno with you, apparently. There you go. <laughs> <Getting bang. laughs> uh, I died a little bit saying that. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody have a good night. Thanks for watching.